Thank you, Frumbly. We're back with another recap of our favorite Don't Trust Anybody show from. I'm your host, Anthony, and I'm going to do my best to be your guide in this week's episode as we're picking up what we left off last week with the Matthews family getting acclimated to town and Sarah getting a message to take out the boy and having a seizure in the town's diner. This week's episode is titled Silhouettes, which definitely alludes to a story that Fatima tells Julie in this episode, but also could be a metaphor for how some people, <coughs> Sarah, aren't exactly who they appear to be. This is a pretty wild episode with a lot happening, so let's not waste too much time. But first, do me a favor, and if, if you're new here, please consider giving this channel a like and subscribe to keep up with our weekly from analyses. Look, I see that the videos are still getting, you know, some views, but the view like ratio is really off with some videos only getting like 30 likes, but a few hundred views. Please, 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 please hit that like button. YouTube still uses this method to help smaller channels like me as a way to help channels grow. I know, I know. But please hit that like button before you move on to your next video and consider subscribing, enabling notifications so you're able to watch these videos right after they publish in order to help you get prepared for season two and season three. Now, back to Frog. We pick up from the last episode where Sarah got the message to kill the boy. This episode opens with Sarah's brother, Nathan, getting told that something happened to his sister, Sarah. He rushes to be at her side when we switch to Sarah and, you know, Dr. Christie having a chat about Sarah's experience. Sarah swears she feels fine and continues to keep her situation as secret as possible to everyone in town. She tells Christy that she feels fine and asks her not to let her brother, Nathan, visit her while she's recovering. Sheriff Boyd walks in at that moment and walks right back out. Christy heads out to speak to Boyd and they talk about Sarah's health. Christy plans to keep Sarah in her clinic overnight for observations, with Sheriff not exactly liking the idea right after a few people lost their lives there not so long ago. The Sheriff asks about the seizures and wants to know if it's possible that some people might be having a physical reaction to from town since it's happening so frequently. This is a very interesting question, and it's really cool to see Boyd joining in on trying to figure out the nature of this town. Ethan and Sarah both experienced seizures while in this place. It's interesting that different people are having different experiences after they arrive in this town. While Ethan and Sarah both had seizures, Jade is having a different experience with seeing what looked like a person buried under a boulder. He also saw that weird red symbol spray painted on the ceiling of that cellar. I like how Boyd is picking up on things. Someone else picking up on things is Dr. Christie, who sees that the sheriff's hand is shaking involuntarily. She asks how long that's been happening and he doesn't really give a straight answer. Christie then looks out the window and sees Nathan finally arriving and tells Boyd that Sarah doesn't want visitors and Boyd agrees to run interference. We then see Boyd step outside and begin talking to Nathan and tries to get him to leave Sarah alone for the night, but Boyd also notices that Nathan is acting sus and asks if there's something else going on that Boyd should know about. Nathan plays it off and Boyd tells him to go touch grass. Nathan backs down and finally walks off. We then switch to see the family from the RV with young Ethan asking if Sarah's going to be okay as he definitely had a front row seat to Sarah's seizure in the diner last episode. His parents try to reassure him that she'll be fine, and Jim suggests that they play a game. He introduces a game he names Problem Solving, and the way you play is by asking questions. You put them on the board as a way to visualize everything you do or don't know. The first question he writes is, where are we? Which is a great first question. Anyway, we see that the new arrivals in From Town are trying to figure out their situation in their own ways. We then switch to a scene revealing that Nathan has Sarah's bloodstained dress from her clinical massacre. 
We then switch to the clinic and we see Sarah looking at the scalpel she used to kill Toby. Sarah then has what looks like a flashback to getting the words on her arm that read, kill the boy. Christy walks in to check on her and offers Sarah some tea. Some tea? We then switch to what looks like Christy's bedroom with Sarah sitting in, commenting how Christy and Kenny are a cute looking couple. Christy and Sarah talk about the relationship some more, saying that she's just friends with Kenny because she has a fiance named Marielle waiting for her at home. They talk a bit about Marielle, but then switch to Sarah talking about, you know, Sarah's relationship status, with Sarah explaining that she's single, and she says that there was someone, but he wasn't. And then she paused and said, it's better he's not around anymore. Who is Sarah talking about? Is she talking about Toby? Because she really did just sneak a kiss from old boy right before sticking him in the neck with a screwdriver. Why is it better that he's not around anymore? Did they tell her to, you know, take out Toby because she liked Toby? Did she have to take out the boy because she's been so nice to him? Is someone trying to break Sarah by making her do heinous things in order to instill obedience or control? Hmm. Sarah quickly changes to explaining how it's just her and Nathan now and gives us a little bit of insight into her history explaining that things weren't very good for her before and Nathan is the one who saved her. She then asks Christy if there's something that she could do, even if it was bad, but would allow everyone to go home and get reunited with their loved ones, would she do it? Christy is initially confused, but lets Sarah know that she would absolutely do that one bad thing for everyone to go home. Hypothetically speaking, of course. We then switch back to Jim, and it looks like he's still playing his game with the family as there's now a lot more notes on the wall. He starts sharing again what they know, but Tabitha begins questioning the purpose of the game. Jim tells her it's important so that they can see what it is that's missing, and then Tabitha mentioned that there's a question that they haven't asked yet. She's hesitant to write it on the wall because she doesn't want to know the answer. We then switch back to Christy and Sarah exiting the clinic, seemingly refreshed after having a girls night when Nathan approaches from behind the clinic and yo, was my guy waiting there for her? Nathan says that he and Sarah need to talk, but Sarah doesn't have the answers that he wants to hear, but assures Nathan that she loves him so much. We then switch to Julie and Fatima in Colony House. Julie is making a list of all the people she thinks might be waiting for her and her family outside of Frumtown. Fatima admits that she also has a similar list and asks Julie who she has listed. Julie doesn't mention many people aside from her grandparents and shares with Fatima that she doesn't have a boyfriend or girlfriend waiting for her at home. Fatima tells Julie that they need some fun and to get dressed and meet her downstairs. We then switch to see Fatima meeting up with Ellis and letting him know that Julie has started making the list and now might be a good time to show Julie the brundles. We then switch back to town with Jade walking around with that radio that he took from the post office, sheriff's office. Trudy sees him walking around with it and she starts overtly flirting with Jade as she's asking him questions about what it is that he's up to. Jade seems genuinely confused by everything that Trudy is saying, like, he doesn't look like he understands at all what it is that Trudy is offering. She decides to make it perfectly clear and tells Jade that if he hadn't chosen town, then she would have rode him like an alabaster dragon. Or maybe, do we mean a lonely dragon? Huh. Jade doesn't really react to the offer, and it's hard to tell if he was interested or disinterested or what. Trudy flirting with Jade isn't a surprise, but his total confusion about what it was that Trudy was offering is a little surprising. But I do get it. I do. Listen, I grew up never realizing when girls liked me, and I was oblivious to when they would try to flirt. So Jade, look, my guy, I understand. We then switch to the post office slash sheriff's office with Boy sitting down alone, staring at the map showing where everyone was going when they arrived at Frumtown. Deputy Kenny enters the room and he brings some breakfast pastries from his mother. The sheriff is a bit unresponsive and seems a little spaced out. 
He tells Kenny that he's going to need Kenny to hold things down for a while so Boyd can go visit his wife. We then switch back to Jade who's discovered the town bar and he seems to have a much bigger emotional reaction to the sight of a bar than he did to Trudy. He meets the bartender who makes small talk with him and fixes him a drink. Jade still seems to be in a state of shock and surprise as he drinks and promptly spits out his glass of liquor, having learned the downsides of a poor man's potato vodka. They begin talking about Jade's arrival with the bartender trying to give some words of affirmation that things will get better. Jade is noticeably frustrated, not just at the awful tasting vodka, but also at everyone's complacency, considering how they're all stuck in from town comparing everyone to rats in a maze. Jade then tries to process their situation a bit more and refers to it as a paradox and thinks out loud about how frustrating their situation is. The bartender slows Jade down because Jade is definitely on the verge of an episode and tells him to settle down, but he also pours him another drink. The bartender decides to amuse himself and fixes himself a seat next to Jade and asks Jade if he's going to be the guy that figures it all out, right? And Jade confidently says, yep, he's not the guy who gets stuck in the maze. He's the guy that designs the maze. Jade then starts mansplaining about how smart he is and how much money he made from selling his company for an obscene amount of money based on a quantum computing algorithm and wait, you mean this dude Jade made the stuff that makes AI possible with quantum com computing? Jade then drifts a little bit, talking about how he's not supposed to be here and he's supposed to be out celebrating. To solve the problem, he needs to know where he is. The bartender then comments that it's like Schrodinger's cat. Jade and I are a little impressed that the bartender is saying something like this. And it, the bartender continues by saying that since we're the cat inside the box, then we just need to let someone know outside the box that they're still alive. He then explains to Jade that he taught intro to philosophy at USC and challenges Jade to fix the radio that he's carrying around to help them get a signal or message to the outside world and let them know that they're still alive. Ergo Schrodinger's cat. We then switch to Creepy Sarah standing outside the house that the RV family is staying in and she shows off her new pocket knife that she swiped from Christie's clinic. We then switch inside the house and we see Tabitha removing the bandages from Ethan's leg, who's reassuring his mom that the wound doesn't really hurt anymore and that it's just a little sore and how? How's this thing only hurting a little? Ethan had a giant hole in his leg. It's only been like what, three or four days since his injury? A week at best. How the F is this little boy's leg all the way healed like that? Even Tabitha comments on how Ethan's is healing very, very fast, with Ethan commenting and saying, Hold on y'all, Ethan's talking. Ethan says, I think this place is special. I know it tries to hurt people, but maybe it tries to help people too. Maybe that could be one of the questions on the wall. With Tabitha asking him to clarify what that question would be, and Ethan replying, is there anyone trying to help? Tabitha and I both believe that that is a great question. We don't get to think about it too long because we then hear Ethan's dad calling him, letting him know that he has a visitor. We then see Sarah downstairs to visit Ethan and the family, and they agree to let Sarah and Ethan play in the playground outside the house. Interestingly, they decide to play on that weird, creepy merry-go-round that seems to be a point of focus for any children that end up in from town. We then switch to seeing Nathan walking into the church house that Father Cotri lives in, and we see Nathan head inside looking for Father Cotri, but he's not there. We then switch to see Ellis, Fatima, and Julie running towards and diving into a lake. Welcome to the Brundles. The Brundles is a dirty little lake not far from Colony House. I guess. <laughs> Fatima loves this place and shows Julie that she could pretend that she's somewhere else and keeps a positive attitude. Julie and Fatima talk a little bit more with Fatima explaining that she came to the US as an 11 year old child but grew up in a village in Iran with her parents and two older brothers. 
Her father was an outspoken cleric, and she comments how it wasn't the most popular thing to be at the time. Now, real quick, an Iranian cleric refers to a religious leader within the Islamic Republic of Iran who holds a position of authority and influence within the country's religious and political framework. These clerics are usually well-versed in Islamic theology and religious teachings, often holding advanced degrees from seminaries. Iranian clerics play significant roles in shaping religious, social, and political aspects of the nation, guiding religious practices, interpreting Islamic law, and participating in governance. They are central figures in Iran's unique system of theocratic governance, where religion and political authority intertwine with prominent clerics even holding high-ranking positions in government institutions and religious bodies. Fatima then explains how on her birthday, some men showed up at her house when she and her family were headed to see her uncle. She remembers being told to hide when everyone else was seemingly in a panic. Her father was dragged outside and she heard the sound of a gun as she saw the silhouette of her father fall down to the ground. Her point is that there will always be monsters in the world, and she promised herself to never let them scare the life out of her. Ellis then approaches, picks Fatima up, and takes her into the lake to swim. We then switch back to Sarah and Ethan playing on the merry-go-round. Ethan asks Sarah how long she's been in From Town, with Sarah explaining that she's only been there for a few months. They talk a bit more, with Ethan brings up the crime monopoly. Hold on, hold on. Ethan is speaking about the crime monocle again. He tells Sarah that his mom and dad are trying to figure out where they are and comments that this is what the crime monocle would do. Hmm. Jim and Tabitha are watching from the window and head outside to talk when Sarah suggests that she take Ethan to see the goats and the chickens in the barn, you know, for fun. Tabitha agrees and tells Sarah that she'll come too, with Sarah quickly blurting out, whoa, hold on, I'm happy to take Ethan by myself um, you guys stay here. And you, y y'all see the setup, right? Tabitha insists, and we see a shot of Jim inside the house with all the questions that are written, with some being clearly visible. It seems like the family has some good questions written on the wall. There's a section where they focus on the talismans that protect the homes, and it seems like Jim has written the following questions about the talismans. Where did they come from? How many? Can we make them? How do they work? They have another section on the wall as well, and this one is dedicated to the people creature monsters with the following questions. Can they be killed? Does light kill them? But there's also some other questions that I can't quite make out. So listen, if any of y'all can make this out, please let me know in the comments. I'll shout you out in the next video. There also seems to be another section about the livestock that is found in the forest with the following questions that I can make out. From where? Where is the where is the livestock coming from? Why don't the creatures kill or eat them? Are there more? Like I said, this family is asking some good questions with one even asking something in common, which I think is referring to the residents in town. Do they all have something in common? And I think everyone does. Everyone that we've seen tell their story in town talks about how they had some significant life-changing event in their life that occurred before they arrived. Fatima talked about the passing of her father, Jim and Tabitha have lost a son, and I think there are others. Let's keep this in the back of our minds, but I think the show is showing us that there are questions that we should be asking ourselves too. We then switch to Sheriff Boyd walking to a single grave in a field that is away from the cemetery that the residents have in town. We learn that this is the grave of the sheriff's wife, Abby. The sheriff then starts talking about the recent events and other things while he's at the site of the grave. He also tells her that he started getting tremors in his hand, the same way that they started with his dad. So the clock is officially ticking. He tells his wife, Abby, that he has this crazy idea that might actually work to get everyone home. He talks a bit more about his idea without being really clear on what his idea is, but he does ask his wife for a sign that he's doing the right thing. We then switch to see Father Katri sitting in a field looking like he's meditating when he gets approached by Nathan. Now, 
This field looks different than the others we've seen as Father Katri is sitting surrounded by some weird stones. There's like five or six of these big giant gray stones assembled in a cir circle with Father Katri sitting in the middle of them with his eyes closed. It kind of reminds me of like a Stonehenge thingy a little but not nearly as big or as intricate. We don't get any explanation on this place other than Father Katri asking if Nathan comes up here much and comments how this place is strange too. Nathan asks Father Katri what the rules are when it comes to confession and asks if he tells him something if it would stay between them. But Nathan warns the priest that it's bad. Like it's really bad. We then switch to Tabitha, Sarah, and Ethan at the barn surrounded by goats and chickens. They talk a bit about their situation and how it starts to feel normal. Sarah then starts talking about how it was different before the talismans and people would have hiding spots all around town and how it's good to know about them in case of emergency and even offers to show Tabitha the one that they have in the bar. We then switch back to Father Katri and Nathan and it seems like Nathan has already confessed because Father Katri looks shook it, telling Nathan that he should have come to him much sooner. Nathan is worried that Sarah might get put in the box and Father Katri tells him that he intends to keep his word, but he's worried about the people in town. We then switch back to see Sarah and Tabitha walking in the barn, and Sarah's showing Tabitha a trap door behind a barn wall. But then creepy Sarah shoves Tabitha inside the room and barricades Tabitha inside with some barn tools telling her that she's sorry and she's doing this for everyone. We then switch back to Father Katri and Nathan returning to town, with the sheriff seeing Father Katri and asking to talk to him. The sheriff has a weird question for the priest and asks, if someone is looking for a sign, how would they know what they're looking for? We then quickly switch to see Nathan walking in the diner looking for Sarah, but she's not there. The bartender is there and tells Nathan that he saw Sarah heading to the barn with the Matthews lady and her boy. Somehow, Nathan looks even more shooketh. We then switch back to the barn with creepy Sarah walking toward Ethan after locking Tabitha inside and yo, this chick got that same damn scalpel in her hands that she took from the clinic and it's not looking good for poor Ethan. Ethan is nervous now too and asks about his mom and Sarah just lures him closer and starts talking crazy about how what's going to happen is going to save everyone just like one of his stories. Nathan then arrives and sees his sister looking crazy near Ethan and tries to talk her out of whatever the hell it is she's doing. Ethan uses this distraction to kick Sarah in the shit. Nathan tells Ethan to run and tries his best to restrain Sarah and in the midst of the back and forth, Nathan accidentally gets his throat sliced by crazy Sarah's super sharp scalpel. Sarah sees what it is that she's done and freaks all the way out. Father Katri arrives on the scene just in time to see Nathan start bleeding out and just looks like a weird disapproving father at Sarah. We then switch to see Julie, Fatima, and Ellis returning from the Brundles and wait, are they a thropper? Hold that thought because we see Nathan running toward them and crying in a panic. Julie tries to get information from Ethan on what's wrong, but Ethan doesn't say a word and just cries uncontrollable like the little kid that he is. Tabitha is still locked in the barn and Jim is seen running toward the scene looking for his wife and son. Jim is able to hear his wife inside the barn and rushes inside to free her. Tabitha tells Jim that she's not the assignment. Where's Ethan? And Jim is all like, say less, and starts running to find his son. Tabitha and Jim head outside and shortly after they begin their search, we see Ellis, Julie, and Fatima arrive with Ethan in hand. The Matthews family reunite right when we see Dr. Christia arrive as she starts tending to Nathan, but it's already too late as she quickly realizes that Nathan is already gone. Father Katri then comes running from around the corner and gives a little nod to the sheriff and wait a minute, wasn't Father Katri already there? Didn't we already see him arrive? Where the F is he coming from now? We don't get any answers and instead we see Sheriff Boyd and Jim talking for a bit about what happened. Jim wants to know where Sarah is and Katri says she ran off into the woods. 
Jim all but tells them that these answers ain't good enough and talks tough a little bit with Sheriff Boyd and the priest, but that's all it is. He just talks tough. He then storms off, leaving the sheriff and the priest stuck on stupid. We then switch inside the Matthews house with the family still recovering from their experience. Julie takes Ethan upstairs so the adults can talk, and the two kids make plans to read about the Cromenacle. Tabitha then tells Jim that she needs something to write with, and we finally see her begin to write on the wall the question that she alluded to earlier in the episode. Did we survive the crash? And now we see that they are all the way committed to asking every question. Tabitha is questioning if they survived the crash with the two cars from way back in episode one. We then switch to the diner and we see Dr. Christie sitting alone when Sheriff Boyd joins her at a booth. She begins telling the sheriff about her talk with Sarah, about their conversation the night before, about what Christie would do to go home, and Christie is clearly feeling guilty about what she considers in her mind is enabling Sarah in her attack on Ethan. The sheriff tries to talk to her and explains that creepy Sarah's actions aren't Christie's fault and tries his best to cheer her up. It seems like it works for a bit when the sheriff takes Christie by the hand to comfort her. Interestingly enough, as they're holding hands, that jukebox radio thingy on the diner table turns on again all by itself. And yo, shout out to LaDonna Hilton from our comments who did us all a huge service and found the names of all the songs that played throughout the show. Like, for real, this is a huge help as I had trouble identifying some of the songs. The song that's playing is If I Had a Boat by Lyle Lovett. The song was released by Lyle in 1987 as part of the album named Pontiac, which is a really popular album that was even ranked at number 201 in the list of the 500 best albums of all time by the German edition of Rolling Stone in 2004. Lyle's album was cited as one of the top 100 albums of the 1980s by a few Italian magazines, and it's also one of the 300 albums listed in the book 50 Years of Great Recordings and more. Cheryl Boyd then tells Christy that this was the sign that he was looking for when, and credits. And wow, yo, this episode, so much has happened in this episode. First off, Ethan's leg is completely healed, and even Tabitha notices that it's healing a lot faster than expected. Father Kadri has a secret place that he goes to to meditate, and that place looks weird. High Guy Jade is starting to gather his thoughts, and seems to be on track to try to solve the mystery of being trapped in this town using the analogy of Schrodinger's cat, to just let people know that they're alive by using the radio to send out a message. Julie... Fatima and Ellis are really, really looking like a thruple right now, especially when you factor in how they all share a room, and Fatima is seemingly fluid with her lovers. And how can we forget creepy Sarah? She took out her brother Nathan and ran into the woods? Huh. And Deputy Kenny, who wasn't really in this episode much. So we got nothing on Kenny, but overall, this was a really fun episode. Jim is asking some good questions, and now Tabitha is wondering if they're even still alive. With the show that has the involvement of the creators of the show lost, it's a valid question to ask if the residents of From Town are even still alive. So many questions, not enough answers. Anyway, that's all I have for this one. Hey guys, real quick, we have a new Discord channel. I'm going to share the link to our Discord channel where we're going to be able to talk about everything about From and also Foundation if you follow that show. And you can talk to me directly and we can interact and share our thoughts on theories on what's happening in this show. Also, if you're new here, please hit this like button, hit that subscribe button, turn on those notifications. So this way you can join us every week on Fridays as we try to gather and break down all the clues in this show to try to figure out what's happening to the residents and prepare ourselves for both season two and season three. Hit that.